right, ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker this afternoon will be Gary Bentrup out of the USDA National Center for Agroforestry. And we're going to move away from Canada and Russia and come back to pollinators. So we'll be talking about agroforestry as a perfect pollinator partnership. I think there will be a little Canadian connection in there too, just to keep that thread going. I do want to apologize for the somewhat marketing title at a scientific uh, meeting. I try to tend to shy away from this because I think it's too easy for us in agroforestry to sometimes uh, put on our marketing hat and lose that objectivity. You know, agroforestry can caramel pattern baldness, and it's a great dessert topping too. <laughs> so I do want to kind of frame that. Well, what's the buzz about pollinators? Well, they play a key role in food production. And we like food, and it's big business. But it also goes beyond food. Over 75% of farming plants in the temperate region require animal pollination. That number is higher in the tropical regions. And you know that um, pollination service cascades into a multitude of different ecosystem services that are very key to um, our health and well-being in society. And they're facing kind of some major issues right now. Honeybee um, colony collapse disorder. We've got the monarch that has declined 80% over the last 21 years. Um, so this has really caught the attention of a variety of people, including the president, who in June of 2014 issued the presidential uh, memorandum on pollinators, directing federal agencies to develop reports, plans, and strategies for dealing with the pollinator kind of crisis. Well, being good feds that we are, we produced a lot of reports <laughs> and paper. <laughs> and here's just an example of some of the reports that have just come out, I mean literally, uh, within the last two weeks. And I'd like to call your attention to the one shown on the screen, the Pollinator Research Action Plan. Um, this particular report, uh, the National Agroforestry Center played a role in outlining kind of what are some of the research direction that we need to do for pollinators. And of course, our role was kind of broadening that vision of habitat and what, how can we provide that habitat. Well, within the last two weeks, the national strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators came out. And this report has three kind of broad overarching goals. First, dealing with the honeybee issues. Second, dealing with the monarch. But the third one, really kind of trying to address that other suite of pollinators. And that is to restore 7 million acres of habitat over the next five years. And I'd like and why is to provide pollination insurance um, so that we use both native pollinators and our honeybees to provide that crop pollination services as well as providing those biodiversity services uh, that we recognize. Well, I'd like to focus for a second on that uh, restoration goal or enhancement goal. Seven million acres of land for pollinators over the next five years. And now, in this national strategy to promote the health, uh, agroforestry was brought forward in the appendix as one of the options for pursuing this restoration and enhancement goal. And so this leads to the question is, is pollinators ready for, or is agroforestry ready, ready for pollinator prime time? What do we know and what do we need to still know in order to maybe play a role in that restoration and enhancement? And most importantly, do we have actionable knowledge to go off of? So, at the National Agroforestry Center, we're uh, embarking right now on a re research review and synthesis of what we know regarding agroforestry and pollinators. Well, if you do a science direct search on agroforestry and pollinators, you're going to get a relatively small number of publications. If you're going to look at agriculture or natural habitat and pollinators are gonna get a much larger sample. And yet, in that literature, there is stuff that is going to be applicable for agroforestry. So it's really a process of going through that research, synthesizing and distilling it into what is 
uh, applicable for agroforestry. And so what I'm presenting here is really kind of some of the preliminary results from this review and synthesis. Well, first off, pollinator species, we kind of hear a lot always about the bees and the birds, or bees, birds, butterflies. Um, but there's really six kind of broad groups. Uh, the research literature really is biased toward the bees and wasps in terms of crop pollination services because they're the key players in that. But from a biodiversity perspective, the other species really play some important roles. I will say what's going to come through this talk right now is going to be a little bit bee-centric. But we are looking at kind of that broader suite of things. So what are kind of some of the preliminary results? Well, of course, there's some general trends that aren't too surprising. Uh, research has shown there is definitely a preference for native plants. Uh, some great work on hedgerows out in California, uh, both new ones and mature ones, a very strong preference. So that's going to dictate how, what kind of plantings we're going to do in uh, agroforestry as far as the benefit pollinators, uh, diversity of flower types, and range of bloom types. And I'll get to that in just a second. And just to point out, pollen and nectar, we think nectar often, and that's relied on the adults but they need pollen for their young. So if we drill in a little deeper into this topic of pollen and nectar, there are resources out there that have done some relative ranking <coughs> in terms of woody species and, and as well as herbaceous species in terms of the value in term of nectar and pollen. And just this is a relative ranking between zero and one, one being that uh, it's about more valuable pollen than nectar resource. When we look at this kind of list, we can see that the Salix species and the Rubus species are particularly valuable, both in the nectar and pollen category. Um, not to say we should limit to those species, but that's just uh, worthwhile information to proceed all of. Them. But that said, you know, we don't often think of pines and pines <coughs> as necessarily pollinator friendly plants. But the fact that they do provide a pollen resource, they might be of, of some value. And then the below is just showing it kind of relative to some herbaceous uh, flowering plants that are really considered prime pollinator plants as a relative uh, comparison. There. Well, this temporal distribution is a really important one to look at. And we need, in order to supply to maintain populations of pollinators over time, you have to provide resources over time. And so this study looked at hedgerows in California and looked at the, the bloom time of these species over the course of the growing season. And you get a pretty dis good distribution of um, pollen and nectar plants for that. But the problem sometimes is they may still not line up when you're going to want crop pollination services. So for instance, the almond groves actually start to flower in mid-February and go through the first part of March. There's really no plants on there that are already going to start to provide that base to build up, say, native pollinators as well. Hence, there's a reason why basically 90% of all honeybee-managed colonies are in California during that time period. So this alludes to a challenge we have looking for appropriate plant material. Told you there's a Canadian nectar. Um, so just pulled this chart out of a, a great resource out of Canada and shows kind of the flowering periods of shrubs in uh, central Alberta and kind of showing that there are some that start in April and go through August. Uh, I like to focus on the willows in the lower 48 uh, willow species are particularly early flowering in um, the lower 48, some starting in um, early March and going through May. And there's some real value in looking at that species as a, a role in pollinator planting. Of course, I just mentioned the early flowering, but there's also some other uh, benefits to this particular uh, family group. There's a fairly high level of sugar per hectare, 
This is due to the number of cat pens on a plant. Um, there's also a high level of crude protein. The protein is very valuable for pollinators for a variety of tissue development, reproductive tissue development. Um, and willows have a high level as a general, although there is variability. Um, crude pro protein uh, above 20% is considered good for pollinators. Interestingly, it's also looked at as a high quality protein. The available amino acids have been studied within some of the Salix species, and they're particularly high. And then a very recent Canadian study, actually coming out this year, was looking at willows within uh, Canada and showed that there is a preference for male flowers, which offer both the pollen and the nectar. And the reason why this is kind of uh, interesting to note is that we could possibly rely on maybe just the, the male plantings if we have an issue of concern over invasiveness of the uh, little species migrating out into a crop line. And then just to try to keep it from being totally decentric, um, woody plants and their role in terms of butterfly and, and moth larva where they can uh, rely on some of the different woody species. We do have data on that, and so there is a potential to start to play connect the dots on, on that. And oaks and prunus are particularly uh, noteworthy um, in that regard. Well, moving on from just the pollen and nectar resources, nesting sites uh, for pollinators, 30% of uh, bees are tunnel nesting um, bees. And these often use hollow stems uh, from uh, shrubby uh, species, particularly the ones listed up there. And we probably can manage these to increase their potential for nesting for pollinators, partially through pruning. Um, also, retaining dead and dying trees where practical, offer uh, 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 habitat for wood boring of beetles that then provide the habitat to the bees. Um, the other 70% of native bees are ground, uh, solitary ground nesting bees. And these need basically disturbed, undisturbed ground to nest in. And this is probably a role where agroforestry, particularly under the tree canopy or woody component part that's not disturbed on any frequent basis, can provide uh, this undisturbed habitat for nesting. And in fact, studies, um, particularly of bumblebee nests, have found that they have been um, a high incident of them along linear woody habitat features like windbreaks, as opposed to being out in either woodland itself or in the grass. So this offers uh, potential for agroforestry plantings as a rural nesting. Well, moving on now, kind of looking at that cumulative habitat effect as opposed to the individual kind of species. There's uh, enough evidence out there to say how far do you get pollination services out from pollinator habitats, such as a hedgerow. And here just shows kind of that, that relationship. Um, this kind of sums up that crop decline, pollination visits decline about 50% at 2,000 feet from natural habitat. That natural habitat could actually be agroforestry plantings if it's uh, appropriate habitat. Um, but we've really been a little deeper than this. Um, size does matter. There's a, even a little bit more information we can glean from the scientific evidence that the different bee species based on size have different foraging distances. Um, you're bigger, you can go farther. And this is important because different bee species pollinate different crops. And so if we're trying to manage for crop pollination services, and we know what bee species we're trying to manage for, we can also go back to how far we need to put agroforestry habitat as pollinator habitat. Well, now moving on to size. How much area of habitat do we need? This is a tougher nut to crack. Some research has been going on on this, and they've really, again, been looking at 
percent of natural habitat within a certain uh, radius of field and seeing what kind of rate of uh, flower visitation do we get. So this is just kind of showing that relationship. Um, and some of the studies showed, hey, we get great pollination visits out about 30% of natural habitat within an area. Well, okay, that's good, but what's the cost trade-offs there? I mean, um, may not be able to have 30, 40% of your uh, agriculture area dedicated to pollinator habitat. So that's still a big unknown. Um, another question in that is just because the pollinators visiting the plant still doesn't necessarily translate into um, increased yield production or uh, the actual pollination service. So there's a few studies out that actually looked at, say, yield production or bump with uh, increasing pollinator habitat. And this one was uh, for sweet cherry, basically a one kilometer radius of habitat, and increasing um, bee habitat. And they did show, actually, they got an increase in fruit set um, over that. But again, it takes up, <coughs> you need to get a fairly high um, density of habitat. So this is, this is still a real question, how much uh, area do we need to put out on the landscape? And this kind of alludes to why we've relied on honeybees and just kind of moved them around to deal with this. All right, moving on to just a, uh, an actual specific practice. Uh, I just grabbed this because this study just is hot off the press. Looked at forest conditions in the southeast, seven different types, and looked at them in terms of their value for pollinators, uh, bees in particular, their abundance and richness. And what was kind of interesting to note, one of the highest ones that had the highest mean number of species and uh, uh, richness was actually probably a type that could be managed as a civil pasture system, mature pine and grass um, with some good species diversity. Again, this wasn't a of a pasture study, but it, it indicates there's some potential here. It also indicates that if we really want to go pollinators, we just clear cut the area. Although <laughs> the red cockaded red cockaded woodpecker probably wouldn't like that. So um, okay, we where is the issue of pollinators and pesticides? And uh, again, within the agroforestry community, we know there's been a fairly well established evidence base on the potential of uh, uh, buffers to mitigate spray drift. And, and here's just some kind of summary of that evidence. So there's some real potential here, but there's also, I think, something we don't necessarily consider. We're creating that buffer as habitat for, uh, uh, for a pollinator, but we're also wanting to use it as a spray drift buffer. We may be creating a sink. And so we're going to have to really think those issues through. Um, one of the ways may be if it's a buffer that really is going to provide spray drift as its primary function, and we may want to design that not as a pollinator habitat, and maybe pick species, again, species that are less desirable to pollinators to prevent that problem. So there's need to be more thought and, uh, on that that topic area. And then lastly, there's some uh, clear evidence that um, bees forage, at stop foraging at a certain wind speed. And this is particularly a problem for honeybees. Um, the native bees actually have a wider range of tolerance for wind speed for foraging. But if we're installing a system that is relying on managed uh, honeybees, the role that, say, windbreaks or other agroforestry practices could have on reducing wind speed could be a value. So where does agroforestry kind of fit within our, uh, this idea of pollinator uh, habitat? And, you know, if we look at this map of where a lot of crops pollinated by um, bees, you know, we see, you know, what we know, the 
California and the Michigan and certain areas. And so in those areas, we might be able to make a good case for using agroforestry as pollinator habitat because they're going to see a real economic benefit. But in other areas of the country where the crops aren't um, really insect pollinated dependent, it's going to be a tougher sell. And, um, and this, trying to sell it on necessarily biodiversity functions like it's probably also still going to be a tougher sell. So we really are going to have to look at what is that larger suite of multiple functions we can get out of these plantings and is, and is pollination services one of those that we can roll in at the same time. And I put up this chart just to show like four different functions and their relationship, the distance from the vegetative uh, buffer or windbreak, for instance, and crop yield, reduced wind erosion, pollination services, and also um, conservation biological pest control. So while the pollination services might not resonate here in Iowa so much, maybe, well, in fact, all these are going to be tough to sell in Iowa, but uh, that, that's another issue. Uh, but crop yield, wind erosion, even biological pest control might be. And because some of the distance things do actually line up, we could maybe actually start to <coughs> accomplish multiple functions on the landscape. So I'd be remiss in not to mention, well, what are the potential downsides of this? And uh, one concern is by providing uh, habitat for pollinators, uh, are we creating basically a place where they can hang out and not have to go out in the field and pollinate the crop? And there's just a few studies that have started to look at this. And so far, one out of like California looked at some hedgerows and so far, that evidence suggests that these are still net exporters of native bees out into the cropland and that you're not basically creating a, uh, a sink for the pollinators to stay in the, the, the habitat and not pollinate the crop. But that probably still needs to be explored a little deeper. Uh, another very uh, important concern is what about it being a source of crop pests and weeds? This is always a concern, and sometimes <coughs> an overblown concern, but uh, it can be a real concern, too. And I just have to bring up uh, the issue of, of buckthorn and the soybean aphid. Buckthorn, historically used in some of our plantings, not really now, but um, it was, and now it's a post plant for the soybean aphid. Um, so we are going to have to be careful in proceeding forward and knowing what are some of the potential uh, negative effects. So that kind of brings us to what do we need to know or still need to know? Well, again, if we still, we've got some good knowledge of species, um, but we probably still need to kind of uh, tease some of those nuances out a little bit more. Configurations here, probably still that the biggest one I think here is that area question. How much area do we need to provide that service um, and make a difference? And uh, so I think that's one of the big ones. Of course, how do we manage these? And then of course it always comes back to economics as we know. And what's the payback time on putting in um, an agroforestry planting for these different ecosystem services. How long does the return rate back um, and you know, the other economic concerns surrounding that? So that's probably one of the biggest ones. There's some research starting to come out that have looked at pollination and uh, biological pest control as two services and the payback period time for putting in, say, uh, a hedgerow and what the cost would be to recoup the planting. So finish up uh, some of the resources that are out there that uh, are worth looking into if this is a topic area of interest. Back to the, the Canadians, so we're gonna come full circle. 
and this is a great resource that you can find at this uh, website, Native Pollinators and Agriculture in Canada. Uh, the Xerces Association has a plethora of resources. Uh, and this is just one example of a publication they just uh, uh, released uh, within the last year. The National Agroforestry Center also has a, a variety of, of resources out there right now. Uh, we put up some agroforestry notes uh, back before pollinators were cool. Um, in 2007, um, things like ancient history. Um, this is our new newsletter that's just hot off the press. You can find that on our website. There's some really interesting uh, little articles in there. Uh, I would suggest taking a look. Um, some other resources such as our conservation buffer guidelines is another um, resource out there. So with that, I'd like to wrap it up. In kind of in summary, I think there's some real potential for agroforestry to provide, to play a role in this uh, pollinator uh, issue. And But we have to be careful in knowing where it's appropriate and really knowing that evidence out there. It's not kind of giving it lip service and say, oh, just because it's a flowering plant put into a uh, agroforestry planting, we've done good. It's, it's going to be more involved in that. With that, thank you.